Hello, welcome to Lost in Movies. I'm Alec Kerr, the film critic for the Conway Daily Sun. Uh, this week joined by... I'm Jonathan Doobie. I'm not a critic anywhere for any newspaper. I just really like movies. And uh, we're reviewing The Mummy, the nth version, upteenth version of The Mummy. Yes, The uh, Mummy. The Mummy. Um, and it's the first film in the very poorly named Dark Universe. It's the latest first film. In the right, the latest... Named. The, the, the official They've tried this a couple of times right. now. This is the really motivated this time, though. Yeah, this is the we're going to get it right. We're going to do it. And uh, so this is Universal's attempt at bringing all their mon Universal monster, classic monsters into one universe like they did back in the 30s and 40s. But they're trying to follow the Marvel template, which may not be a good idea. But check out the trailer. The trailer makes it look really good, doesn't it? Yeah. I kind of like the trailer. Um, the trailer and what they've been really using in all the marketing, it's the one scene that they are showing any time any cast member appears, even if they're not in the scene, I'm exaggerating, is that plane crash scene, which yes. is the best thing in the movie. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's um, a very, very well done and it's, gimbal work. And it's Tom Cruise doing his thing of, I'm doing an impossible stunt on my own. They actually did it in real Z G zero G. Oh, really? I wasn't um, aware of that. They did, you know, so what they had to do was they had it, I think they called it the uh, the puke machine or something like that. <laughs> so they didn't actually go up in an airplane, I don't think, but they, they went into a simulator. And so 30 seconds at a time, they would be in zero G. Oh, and boy. so that's how they did the scene. That, uh, that actually sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, so that is great, but... You don't need to pay a ticket to see it because they're showing it on every talk show. It's online. You've already seen it in the trailer. It is the best thing about this movie. It doesn't really fit this movie because it is kind of like a Mission Impossible stunt thrown into a horror movie. But whatever. My biggest complaint about this movie falls into that. This movie was all over yeah, the place. It doesn't know what it wants to be. So, therefore, it kind of had no sense of style. No, it didn't. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the director, Alex Kurtzman. I think this is only his second film. His other one was kind of a smaller, more personal film. Um, and he's the writer of uh, the Transformers series. Uh, he did the first two Star Trek movies. Um, he was a producer on the Amazing Spider-Man movies, which shows how good of a world builder he is. 
Yeah, he's <laughs> really good at building worlds that don't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what's happening here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, of course, the special effects in this movie are better than the special effects, you know, in the Mummy movies with Boris Karloff. Well, yeah. The Mummy movie and, with Christopher Lee. Yeah. And but those movies... You knew what you were watching. Right. Oddly enough, the effects aren't really that much better than the 1999 one with Brendan Fraser. And they reused one of them. I know. Which is they, like... The big sand face thing. It's like, wait, what? That was like the signature thing from that movie, and you're stealing it? <laughs> yeah. The, why that? If anything, you know, they could have done, you know, big sand hands, or had right. her, like, come up out of sand, like the Sandman from the third Spider-Man movie. Something. And walk around like that, instead of having the big sand face. Although this one did it over London, as opposed to, you know, in the desert. Right. So... Um, so I, I don't know. I think the issue with this movie, the, the one of the big issues, is that it doesn't really want to be a mummy movie. It wants to be, let's set up the Dark Universe movie. Yeah, it is all set up. Um, it's Easter eggs. and The minute it's like, it stops right in the middle of the movie to set up Prodigium, yep. which is this, essentially, since they are trying to copy Marvel, it's their shield it's their version of shield it's their version yeah, of run shield, by dr jekyll instead which of nick Fury. Make no, no no sense um i mean i guess if you want to reboot dr jekyll and mr hyde sure but uh why um and it also obviously everyone knows what do who dr jekyll and mr hyde is you would like to think but if you don't know what that is when all of a sudden he's changing into mr hyde you're like wait what's going on who is this there's yeah. no setup, there's no explanation, and they even kind of change the origin where the serum he takes is to suppress Hyde instead of evoke Hyde. Actually, in the original novel, um, he had to do both. I know. I, yep. yeah. So, so it, it makes sense if you go way back to the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Right. Hyde from the novel. Yeah, I, I, I know, but it, it's still, it's very, because the, well, the way they explain it is, well, I had to create this thing to cure myself. So it seemed like Hyde was a disease. So it wasn't like something yeah. he created with himself. It was something that was there and he had to suppress. So it's kind of changing the, the mythos of that, which I guess is fine, but you should have had an, your own film for that because just drop, dropping this character in here and having him be your Nick Fury is very strange. I just, I feel like maybe they didn't think that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde were interesting enough to warrant their own new movie, so they decided to cram him in here and have him be the Nick Fury-esque character. Right. Um, and actually, um, the one scene where he does become Hyde, I kind of liked, and I kind of liked that he had this Cockney accent. And yeah. I, I liked that, um, I but thought, it didn't deserve to be in this film. Russell Crowe's acting in that scene was really good. There is a, a point that just sticks in my head to the point where I had to look it up when the movie was done to make yeah. sure. Russell Crowe says to Tom Cruise that you're younger than I am, but you should be weary of old guys like me. Yeah. Tom Cruise is a year older than Russell Crowe. <laughs> I mean, granted, Russell Crowe shows absolutely every minute of his age, and right. Tom Cruise probably really is the vampire Lestat, because he hasn't, he still right. looks like, he could still pass for 35. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, which, is, which is funny, but I do love in that scene, there's like, this moment where he's like, oh, just come help, come, come hang out with Eddie Hyde, or something like that, and I was yeah. like, that's hilarious. Yeah. Um, but again, that scene, just like with the plane scene, doesn't deserve to be in this film. It does. It's So you have all these scenes that are kind of cool. The plane crash, the hide scene. They're kind of cool as isolated scenes, but they don't fit with this movie. No, they don't. They don't. And it seems like re-editing and retightening. you could have made this kind of like a dark conspiracy movie type of thing yeah so that it would feel the horror and thriller elements as opposed to what looked like they were kind of trying to do an action adventure type of thing right which i think worked for the first brendan fraser one they 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 blended action adventure with the uh supernatural elements right, fairly they, well they were basically following the indiana jones template yeah. in that case and they i think the key to that was it was campy it had a sense of humor it knew what it was. This doesn't know what it is. Right, it's campy and it has a sense of humor, but I don't think those are intentional at all. I think Alex Kurtzman 
doesn't know how to direct for tone. And I think part of it is that they're calling this the dark universe, so we have to make it dark. And there's like a sequence where there's some really potentially funny dialogue, and there's this thing where there's these undead, they're not really mummies, they're undead skeletons, and it could play almost like Evil Dead. That's there's true. limbs that are coming off, but the tone of it is all off, it's too somber, and if they just tweaked the tone a little bit, that sequence could have been really funny, but I don't think the director knew how to do it. Yeah, that and the the mummy, the establishing of the character of the mummy herself, you had no way of knowing what her powers were. Right. They were just like, oh, she has this power, and now she has that power. Yeah, she and has... So yeah, the, she has the powers of the god of death. Right, right, and then but she needs to resurrect the god of death because why? You already have his powers in theory. Yeah, you know, and I I don't know. I, I However, don't know. the actress playing the mummy, well, she's fantastic, as well as the actress playing um, the 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 female lead yeah. in the movie, um, who it, they were both fantastic. They were both so good in this movie, they took it seriously, so it's kind of too bad they had to share space with Tom Cruise and well, the his other scenery thing, chewing. I mean, they were fine. They were good, but neither of them were given anything to do. Not much. Um, Not much. Considering this is called The Mummy, Sofia Batella doesn't really have that much screen time. No, she really doesn't, And but she makes the best of she does. She's every minute really she does. She's really good, and she's... I wish we could see more of her, and spoiler... We're not going to. Chances are, no. But, I mean, in the last Mummy series with Brendan Fraser, they killed Imhotep at the end and, and they right. brought him back. Well, the like he, anyway, and so. this is, we're going to get into spoilers here. Because, basically, this movie was a two-hour setup to make Tom Cruise not really the mummy, but to give Tom Cruise the mummy powers. Yeah. Which is, when I saw that, I was like, that is such a cop-out. You just made me sit through two hours of... Let's make Tom Cruise a monster. And so it makes this whole thing of, hey, we're doing something different. We have a female mummy. Sort of a cop-out. Because it's like, yeah, we sort of did, but we got rid of her, and now here's a dude again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and was he a good guy mummy at the end? Is he a bad guy mummy? Well, there's, he will be, he'll be pulled to the dark, blah, 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 blah. It's like, you know, I think he's good. It's like, oh, whatever. Yeah. And that's the thing, like... If that had been the arc, because Tom Cruise's character is, isn't necessarily a bad guy, but he's morally ambivalent. Yes. And so the arc for his character is supposed to be that, oh, there is good in him. And he loves the female lead. Sort of. Sort of. Maybe. Um, but the scenes to justify that arc aren't in the movie. So when you get him, like, being this tortured monster, I'm going to do good, maybe I'll be pulled to evil, it's not earned at all. I do feel like I didn't see the whole movie. There and are definitely scenes yeah. missing. Unlike most action movies and big popular franchise movies, this one falls in quite a bit under two hours. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm kind of glad of that because I didn't really want that much more. Yeah. When I mean... Done. If they had cut all the stuff with Prodigium and setting up the rest of the universe and actually put a few more scenes between, I think her name is Annabelle Wallace mm. um, and Tom Cruise, where you can actually understand their character de de development and their arc a little bit better, um, and more scenes with Sofia Batella, um, and actually made it a 100% a mummy movie, it could have been okay. Yeah, yeah. They talk about when the two characters first come together in the film, they talk about how they had met once before, not that long ago. It's like, well, they could have really showed that. Yeah, why, why say, oh, we had a one-night stand and you stole my, like, well, why wasn't that in the movie? Right, and she was far more interesting than, the, than Tom Cruise's comic relief sidekick. Yeah, which I like Jake Johnson. I think he's a funny actor. He's great on New Girl, uh, but he was unbelievably annoying in this movie. Well, his character, I think, was really pulling from that best friend character from American Werewolf in London. Yes, absolutely. Which did so many things right, blended horror and comedy oh, yeah. so well with some adventure. Which, again, is another example of how they don't understand tone. Alex Kurtzman doesn't understand tone. Because, yes, they pulled this, this plot point from American Werewolf in London. Right. Um, which was played for horror and laughs really well, and it doesn't really play here very well. 
I like franchise movies. Yeah. I like that they're trying to do something with this dark universe because yeah. I love the old Universal movies. And the further they went on, the more they had when you had, you know, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman right. and then House of Frankenstein, which had everybody. And now, and all these crossovers. Those then, were silly yeah. at that point. But and it then was they, good tone. And then they got, and their fun. then there was Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein yeah. where you got completely yeah. silly. And I love the Hammer horror films starting in the 50s and going right up through the 70s, which was kind of like in color and sexier, but not necessarily right. erotic. And very and very much in color, like technicolor, yeah. like blood yeah. red. Bright red. red blood, and I really like those. So I really want a Dark Universe franchise. But if you're going to start a franchise... You've got to make a good movie to start with. Right. And I feel like the reason those Universal movies worked so well when they started cross crossing over is because they were never made with that intention. The first few films were made, and then they were like, oh, well, these films are all great. They're all really popular. Let's start mixing these characters together. That wasn't ever the intention. Right. And also, I think it helped that all those films were written and directed by the same group of maybe like four or five people. And so even though they weren't trying to establish a universe, they were establishing a united tone because yes. you had the same creative people working on all these films. Yeah. Yep. That um, was and so trying to plus. force it is the problem. And especially when trying to follow the Marvel template of having this, this one person that's going to unite all the monsters to do battle with another monster. Would you know that's what they're going to do? Of course. Um, what they should have done is just what happened back in the 30s and 40s. Have each character introduced in their own film, and then just have them meet later. That's all you have to do. That's true. That's absolutely true. Uh, I, would have, I would have greatly preferred a more mummy-centric movie. And, you know, maybe have Dr. Jekyll in it. Maybe have Prodigium in it. Yeah. But much less of a force. Right. You know, have that be... Like Nick Fury showing up in Iron Man. Right. You know, it's like this nice little tacked on thing and maybe throw in an Easter egg here. Right. And there. I've actually heard somebody say, um, they're like, oh, why wasn't there a teaser scene at the end of The Mummy? But we got that scene in the middle of the movie. Yeah. If that prodigium scene had been at the end as a, like a post credit scene, that would have been fine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or one of those mid credit scenes yeah, or something you know, like whatever, that. Whatever, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, but yeah, um, the thing is, like again, going back to tone, this movie does actually have a pretty good like B movie horror plot where she wants to put you know set the 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 god of death into Tom Cruise's body so he can become a living god, um, which is a classic like B movie horror plot. And she has this, like, psychic link with Tom Cruise, which kind of goes back to the original Boris Karloff movie, where he had a link with the, the woman in that, was that with the reincarnation of his lover. Um, so if they had actually just played it like a campy B-movie, it probably would have worked, except everything is so serious in this movie. Yeah, yep. And Tom Cruise, you know, is, you know, big smiles all the time, no matter what he's doing. The thing is, I really do like Tom Cruise as an actor. I think he's... He's very charismatic. I feel like he's very charming. He can be serious. He can do serious work. He has before. Uh, Magnolia, Collateral, where he does get rid of that, that smile and, that, and, and actually does emote. I think the problem here is, and I just have to keep putting it on Alex Kurtzman, is that he doesn't know how to direct his charisma. And so he kind of just becomes smarmy and glib and has all this manic energy that just makes the character completely unlikable. One of the things that I have heard, because I don't usually read up on, yeah. you know, these uh, different Hollywood insider stuff of who's married to who and whatnot. Right. But one of the things that I did hear, hear about this is that Alex Kurtzman being, you know, a newer director, yeah. Tom Cruise pushed him around a lot. And Tom Cruise was really more of a force in the creation of this movie than he probably should have been. Well, maybe that's true. Because um, I feel like Tom Cruise, he is talented, he is charismatic, but he needs a director to rein him in yes, and get yes, good work out of him. Um, the He's very good in the Mission Impossible series. He's been good in something like Last Samurai. 
Um, he's been good in the Spielberg movies he's been involved with. Um, and it's because he has a strong director in all those cases that can kind of pull in what works with him. Right, right. And also, I, I really feel like replacing Tom Cruise would have been the way to go. Getting an actor that's more known for drama than for action, that's why Iron Man worked so well. Yeah. Iron Man was an ultimate Robert Downey Jr. vehicle right. to completely redefine his career. Tom Cruise, everybody knows him as an action hero, even though he's done, and done well, some dramatic roles. I wouldn't say he's very good in comedies. People in comedies are good around him when he's there. Um, I mean, he was he was good when he did his shtick in Tropic Thunder. Um, I think he can be funny, but again, it's a matter of having the right material and having a good director. So, yeah, but someone else, especially yeah. someone who is, you know, kind of getting out of another franchise. Right. You know, or, or something something along those lines. I mean, there are so many different actors yeah. that and, really would have And again, better. even if you had a different actor, there are are scenes missing in this character's arc that make it difficult to to be invested in this this story arc and here's the odd thing like when he actually did there's a few very brief moments where he's got this god inside of him and he's like don't look at me and like I was like oh well those he's actually playing those kind of well he's in shadow he's kind of got this darker voice and I'm like, well, he's playing that well, but it's un it's not earned, though, at all. But I was thinking, and I was kind of hoping in an odd way, that that dark power was actually turning him into the Dark Universe's version of Dracula. Mm -hmm. A lot like, um, I hate to bring video games into this, but that one of the Castlevania video games, mm -hmm. which has Gabriel Belmont actually becoming Dracula at the end of it as your big trick ending. Right. And Tom Cruise becoming Dracula at the end of this movie as an attempt to save this woman. It's like, that would have been pretty cool. But then the next scene that they show Tom Cruise, he's in the desert and, and, he's back and bright being... sun and um, he's, you know, smiling and, and Right, he's cocky back to being and... this cocky adventurer. And yeah. so... With with his comic relief sidekick again, like, and he could have been more like I hate to say, but more like he was with Lestat. Yeah, and he was great. That's as the Lestat. thing, and, and you just bring up a, a good point. Like the way they could salvage this character, because I really don't like the character, is if they actually have him go to the dark side, and they wind up having him be the big bad. That it, would be nice. That was some. That is something they could do with if everyone has to fight him. Whenever they have their big crossover movie, if he goes completely dark, because we know he has unchecked powers, basically, um, that could be really interesting. And we do know that Tom Cruise can do a good villain because of Lestat, because of Collateral. He can do a good, interesting villain. And so maybe that's a way to save this character. That, that could work. And I wouldn't mind seeing him get into a fist fight with Javier Bardem. Yeah. Who's supposed to be Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. Um... The next film I actually am interested in, um, they are going to do a remake of The Bride of Frankenstein as their next film, and uh, Bill Condon is directing it. Bill Condon, one of his first films was Gods and Monsters, which was about the making of Bride of Frankenstein. So he clearly has a real affinity for this material. I loved Gods and Monsters mm -hmm. because I'm a fan of those old Universal yeah. films. And, I mean, it was great. So, yeah, he is He's he the is perfect, perfect, perfect to do it. that. He even, because he directed a Twilight movie, and there was even a flashback in that Twilight movie that was done in black and white that was just, like, dripping with that Universal 1940s monster feel. So he very clearly loves those films. And if he's allowed to make it's a standalone movie and not have to force in prodigium and all this other stuff. If he can just make a standalone Bride of Frankenstein movie, I think it could be really good. I, I think so, too. I think um, so, too. But I just really hope they don't say, oh, well, you have to put this in there and you have to put in that in there and you have to set up that Dracula movie we're doing. Oh, yeah, and can we have a cameo of Johnny Depp as the Invisible Man? And can we give another Creature of the Black Lagoon Easter yeah. egg? Because there was one in this. Yeah. Um, if... If they start doing that, they'll wind up ruining the movie, which I feel like maybe they should have led with Bride of Frankenstein. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. But the thing is, I I don't know. I think that you can't really ruin a movie specifically because you're trying to cram too many characters and too many Easter eggs into it. I just believe that you have to do it 
right. Right. And, and a they... good example of that was Batman Begins. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many Batman villains were in Batman Begins? That, that is true. Five. There were five specific Batman right. villains in that movie, and it didn't feel overpacked. Because and it every was character had a purpose for the story, and that's how you do it. If they're just like throwing in cameos, like, hey, there's the Invisible Man, hey, here's this, here's that, that doesn't work. Because what made Batman Begins work is that every character had a purpose and drove the story forward. Yes, absolutely. So they could do that. I mean, could they work in the Invisible Man? Maybe. Maybe he's just Holly Griffin and he's not the Invisible Man yet. Right. You know, could they work in Prodigium? Maybe as like a, these are the men in black type of type right. of characters. Yeah, if you throw in another like brief scene with Henry Jekyll, um, maybe Henry Jekyll somehow contacted in the process of making the bride, something to that effect, that would be okay. But as long as it pushes the story forward and isn't just a scene where the movie comes to a complete halt to introduce this character for, hi, I'll see you in the next movie, that's a, then that would be fine. But if it's, if it's like that, if it's just throwing in a random scene, it, it'll kill the movie. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And Bride of Frankenstein does not necessarily mean that we don't get a decent origin for Frankenstein's first monster. No. Because the Bride of Frankenstein could arguably be the Bride of Dr. Frankenstein, who, right. in some versions of some different things, in a part becomes the monster. Right. Or a monster. Right. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, Javier Bardem has been announced as Frankenstein's monster, which, sure, why not? He's a great actor, yeah. and I think that that's really all it takes to play Frankenstein's monster is you need a great actor. Physically, he should be larger than life, based on the description in the book. Right, and Javier but Bardem is a you big... you can change enough. Javier Bardem's a big guy, so, I mean, I think he's over six foot, so that's fine. And you can always put some lifts on him. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And camera tricks. I yeah. mean, I mean, look at what they did for the Lord of the Rings films. Right. They had, and uh, certainly a better choice than Robert De Niro. So, <laughs> Robert De Niro's a good actor, but yeah, he really chewed on the scenery yeah. for that. Movie. Um, pretty bad. Yeah, Frankenstein's monster with a New York accent. Yeah, in, that was in, a little in much. period England. And going <laughs> up against Kenneth Branagh, who's yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, no, yeah. Um, and actually, while we're talking about that, like, um, they didn't, it wasn't Universal that did that, but for, in the early 90s, um, it was actually Columbia that did the Dracula, the Frankenstein, and the Jack Nicholson Wolf. Yes. Um, now, they weren't meant to be crossovers, but at least the Dracula and the Frankenstein movie, they were both produced by Francis Ford Coppola. So at least visually, they sort of had the same aesthetic. Yeah, and, and so that you was can nice. you can oftentimes get them in in a two pack yeah. at Walmart in the five dollar bin. Um, you know, and then Wolf was completely unrelated, obviously. But it was kind of nice that I think that Dracula came out in ninety two, and then Frankenstein and Wolf came out in ninety four. So there was kind of like this brief resurgence of yeah. these monster movies. Yeah, and since we're on the topic of Wolf, interestingly enough. The first time I saw Wolf, I caught a bit of the end of the movie mm -hmm. as it was running on HBO. And Jack Nicholson fighting James Spader looked way more like Wolverine and Sabretooth <laughs> than any <laughs> other Sabretooth <laughs> that we've seen in any of the Mar yeah. uh, the uh, Fox X-Men movies. Yeah. I actually really like Wolf. I think it's, it's a pretty solid werewolf movie. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Um, and uh, since we have other time, um, should we talk about some of the other mummy films that have happened yeah i mean i i did just watch the boris karloff one um love it it's great it's great and it it kind of it has more of this quiet horror and this tragic love story which was carried over um into uh the brendan fraser a little bit and i think the key to the mummy is that he is a tragic figure he is he is monstrous but he is also a tragic figure who lost his love and really that's all he wants he wants to get his love back yeah yeah, in, in the Boris Karloff version, what happened, you know, to him is really not his fault. Yeah. So then, um, as as it comes down to it, uh, what do you think? You haven't really said, did you like it or not? Um, I was saying at work the other day that if it shows up on cable and you have absolutely nothing else to do, it's a rainy day, you don't have any books to read, go ahead and watch it. Otherwise, I say completely, absolutely skip it. 
I say, watch it. Yeah. It's fun. Go into it knowing that you're not expecting very much, and just watch it because it's fun. Yeah, it's a time killer, but I would not pay to watch it. If it shows up for free on Netflix or something like that, it'll, well, it'll kill time. Luckily, you're a critic, so you don't always have to pay to watch it. That's true. It. I, want, um, I don't want my eight bucks back, and the yeah. popcorn was good. So, well, there you, you know. go. Um, so I'm not sure what we're going to be doing next week, um, but uh, come back and get Lost in Movies again.